Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming to our second Croningen uh, lecture on modes of reasoning. It's a pleasure to have our speaker today, Professor Stuart Eldon, of whom I'm going to say a couple of things in a moment. But let me begin by saying something about uh, Groningen lectures on modes of reasoning. Uh, some of you in the room uh, might have been here last year when we inaugurated this lecture series. And uh, some of you would know that uh, these lecture series are intended to be uh, set in a context that started uh, long ago at the University of Groningen. And these were the lectures that Carl Jaspers delivered uh, here at the university in 1935. And the lectures were uh, delivered under, or well, they were uh, subsequently published under the title of Reason and Existence. And in those lectures, Carl Jaspers was inviting us to think, to think critically at a time when it was very difficult for him to do so in Germany, and uh, at a time in which Europe was undergoing tremendous crisis. The spirit of these lectures is therefore, therefore to open up thought. And we call them modes of reasoning, not in vain. We want to invite you, the audience, the speakers, to reflect about the ways in which we reason. There's no single way of reasoning, and reasoning is already a political practice. It's an exercise of power. And therefore, we should open up the space for us to be able to do that. This is an interesting room. We feel observed all the time by all these uh, former professors who have uh, retired, but they keep on looking at us. But it's a reminder to us about what we do in academia, which is that we think, that we read, that we, we teach, we write, especially we write, and we remain students. Somebody today was saying, well, I'm just a student. And I was thinking, I'm also just a student. And we remain students. And that is why we select the people we invite to speak in this series very carefully. Last year, we had the pleasure of having Professor Michael Dillon an emeritus professor of politics at the University of Lancaster to open up the series. And uh, Professor Dillon is retired and is a very senior professor. This time, we decided to choose, if not the one, one of the youngest, brightest scholars of our generation in the field of governance, politics, uh, power, and you give it the discipline you want, geography, international relations, politics, philosophy. Uh, this is why we decided to choose uh, to ask uh, Stuart Eldon to come and talk to us. Stuart uh, is, a, is a scholar which uh, fits very nicely into the initiative of modes of reasoning. Indeed, in the books that he writes, uh, which, uh, some of which I will mention in a moment, he always gives us some hints as to how is it that he is reasoning about his topics. He's a very good person to follow in relation to that. Stuart has worked on many various topics, but they're all related. They all have uh, um, a thread that helps us to think, and always to think, of course, fa following initially a Heideggerian line. And he's written widely about uh, Martin Heidegger. He's written and translated Lefebvre, Lefebvre uh, pardon my pronunciation. He ri he's written uh, a lot about the politics of calculation, which is a topic I like very much, yes. speaking against numbers. It's a wonderful piece, perhaps the least cited of all, because it's a very difficult piece. I was going to say dangerous. It's also dangerous, perhaps. Uh, but it's a wonderful invitation to open up uh, our thinking, our mode of reasoning about calculation and power, which I think uh, has turned you into, into a wonder, wonderful scholar. But more, re more recently, he's written about terror and territory. And territory, of course, is the concept for which he's uh, uh, best known, perhaps in the last 10 years. And that's, that's how long this, this project has taken us. Maybe you say something about that. Um, and he's written this wonderful volume, which is really a piece of scholarship called The Birth of Territory. It was published last year. And uh, not an easy book, but it's the kind of book that will remain, will have a wonderful shelf life perhaps like this professors up here, and uh, will uh, remind us that we must take this idea uh, curiously and interestingly. Uh, he's, of course, worked uh, on uh, translating the work of uh, Peter Sloterdijk into English, and uh, he has opened up um, this, his thought uh, for scrutiny and discussion. He's very active in the area of journals. Uh, he, has, uh, been, he was very active in creating the Journal of Foucault Studies, uh, he, are you still the editor of Environment, Environment and Planning D? 
uh, which is uh, a journal which, uh, although coming from geography, has a lot to offer to critical international relations. And some of the readings that we offer you uh, have to do with that. Something which is quite admirable about Stuart is that he's always got a project in mind, and not one, but several. Uh, when you speak with him, you know that he's always telling you what's coming next. It's not the next two years. He always has his head quite uh, ahead of him. He's working on a project now on Foucault's last decade, which is, for us in particular, a very interesting decade where he started to, well, he actually developed most of his work on uh, what we know as governmentality. Uh, he's working on a project on Shakespearean territories, of which I wish to know more about. And uh, now he's working on a project on the notion of the geo and geopolitics. I believe this is part of that project. And of course, the relation between territory and the urban. Stuart sits uh, within geography and within international relations and politics. It's very difficult to define where does one begin and the other one ends. And I like to think of Stuart as a public intellectual. He likes to tell us what he's doing. He likes to tell, uh, tells us, tell us how he does that. He's got a blog which has over 7,000 subscribers. So whenever you blog something, it goes across the world. It's great to disseminate books and articles and stuff like that, especially when he comments on them. But he likes to tell us what is it, and what is it that he's doing, how is it uh, that he is doing, and that's not very common within uh, contemporary scholars, at least. So without further ado, he's going to speak to us now for 45 minutes, uh, 50 minutes, uh, on the topic of globe, governmentality, and geometrics. After the session, we're going to have a question and answer session, and uh, at the end of which I am going to give a couple of announcements for the seminar tomorrow. So Stuart Elden, welcome to Carmen. Thank you for that far too generous uh, introduction uh, and thank you for the honour of inviting me to give this second lecture. Uh, it's a, a great honour to be here, it's the first time I've been in this beautiful city and to follow in the footsteps of Michael Dillon uh, who was actually the external examiner on my PhD, uh, a good friend and somebody I admire greatly uh, is another great honour, so thank you. Over the past several years I've been thinking about the globe uh, and to relate the globe to two other terms, world and earth, and to think about the relation and the difference between those. It strikes me as strange that while globalization is a major topic in a whole range of disciplines, we still have a lack, I think, of an analysis of the relation between globalization, political space at a variety of scales, and particularly the question of territory. At the same time as that, there's a literature within philosophy and within social theory on the concept of the world, and yet much of that seems to me to be very frustrating in how detached it is from what's actually going on in the world, in the globe, in politics today, the ways that it is um, economic, social, cultural phenomena are being spread across the globe. One example, though, of when those philosophical ideas do get picked up and used by more practical political international relations literature is the notion of deterritorialization, a notion that comes out of the work of Deleuze and Guattari, but seems to be kind of detached from any kind of sense of how that term might be used or even what the notion of territory behind it uh, is, is going on. For me, at least, deterritorialization should always be partnered by a re-territorialization the continual making and remaking of spatial relations rather than the complete detachment of them from those kind of political spaces. Now, in thinking about this philosophical work on the question of world and trying to relate it to more concrete phenomena, there are a number of thinkers that were important to me in thinking through those ideas. The first one, as was mentioned, was Heidegger and then the thinkers coming in the wake of Heidegger's work, trying to turn Heidegger's work to more progressive political purposes than he did himself, and the Heidegger politics question has come back up again in recent months, but also about people that were trying to relate it to more concrete phenomena. So there were thinkers that were important to me, such as Eugen Fink's book, Spiel als Weltsymbol, or Play as a Symbol of the World, and then Costas Axelos, a Greek emigre who made his career in Paris, writing a book called Legitimum, The Play of the World, or The Game of the World. 
These seem to me to be important but largely untapped philosophical resources for thinking about the question of the world, or what Axelos calls mondialisation, and he wants to distinguish that from globalisation. He suggests that globalisation forgets the notion of the world. It simply thinks about the way that the phenomena are being unfurled at a, at a great scale, but forgets what this notion of a world is that's there, that the world disappears, the process becomes more important than the space. Henri Lefebvre, who I've worked on quite extensively, picks up these ideas out of this philosophical work and puts it to work in more practical, political kinds of concerns. It comes through particularly in his four-volume book, De l'État, on the state, but it's also in this collection, the State Space World Collection, that Neil Brenner and I put together of some of the key works out of Lefebvre's work on the question of the state uh, and that relation of the state to shaping political space and increasingly how that's working now at a worldwide level. And Peter Schlotterdijk's work that was also briefly mentioned, his work has also been important to me thinking about these kinds of questions. The three volumes of the Spheres trilogy, two of which are now translated into English, but I understand more are available in Dutch. So out of all of this work, a number of questions came up for me about how we think about this relation between the world and the globe. How does the world get thought before all of those processes get unfurled across the surface of the globe? How does thinking the world relate to the practice of globalization? Is there a way, a potential, for thinking about the world in a way that doesn't fall into mechanistic, calculative, technocratic ways of thinking about this, what we might call regimes of global calculation and the global politics that go alongside those. It seems to me if we think about the world in relation to globalization, we realize that this is in no sense a transcending of spatial or territorial questions, but it's simply working them through at different scales to different spaces, shaping and reshaping rather than the abandonment of these kinds of relations. The process of globalization on the understanding that I have of political space of territory is that the space and time understanding that emerges in the scientific revolution within Europe is simply now being applied to the planet as a whole rather than to smaller discrete spaces in the surface of the planet. If you can understand in terms of the calculative extended understanding that geometry has and how that gets worked through in political space with large scale surveying and cartography projects for territories, this, I think, is increasingly being scaled up to work at the level of the globe as a whole. The way of determining, as you have particularly in René Descartes' work, of geometry as the primary way of understanding the extension of material matter extended in three dimensions, which geometry is the science that allows us access to these questions, this is now being uh, applied increasingly to global politics. So a difference of degree rather than an ontological transformation be the way I suggest we kind of think about those questions. But that work on the world ran into somewhat of a dead end. I couldn't work out where to take those kinds of arguments around that world-globe relation. And I've been trying to approach what I think are similar questions, but from a different angle. And that's what I'm going to try and talk to you about today, about how we might think about the question of geopolitics, but by bringing back kind of a material physical sense into how we think about geopolitics. Geopolitics, it seems to me today, has increasingly become basically global politics, or big international relations, scaled up to apply to these things at a larger scale, rather than having any kind of sense of this notion of the geo, the earth, that the geopolitics initially was related to. So that we find a whole range of people um, thinking like uh, Robert Kaplan, for example, that you can turn back to the work of Halford Mackinder, a Victorian British geographer, or even the work of Friedrich Ratzel is being returned to. The early geopolitics people are being returned to in thinking about these big global uh, politics. Or people read Hamda Bly's latest book of Why Geography Matters, for example. And even critical geopolitics work, it seems to me, still thinks about this as critical global politics or critical world politics. It's still thinking about this in terms of the way international relations is being thought through, and it's offering a kind of critical, perhaps a post-structuralist approach to those kinds of questions. But can we think geopolitics back to what the root of the word itself actually means? Earth politics, 
a material, grounded sense of how we think about political kinds of questions. And, and this is the challenge I want to talk to you about a little here, can we do this for progressive political purposes, or does this always return back to the reactionary uses to which that has been put in the past? Because geopolitics does literally mean the politics of the geo, the earth, the land, the planet, or the world. Each of those terms, I think, having slightly different registers, this would be expanded if we think about this in other European languages, let alone going outside of European languages. But all of them as different ways of conceptualizing what I want to get at with this notion of geopolitics, a politics of the earth. Now, the earth is a complicated question, and many people have thought about some of those complexities. The philosopher John Salas thinks about this. Uh, I'm not going to read the first part of this <coughs> quote, but I'm going to look and, and focus on some parts in the second part of it. He's asking, though, the question, what is the earth? Is the earth something that can be defined, something that we can make sense of? And he turns to this and says, well, one of the ways that we can think about the Earth is not simply the planet Earth, but also Earth as one of the original elements alongside fire, Earth, and water. And it's that kind of earthy, material sense of politics that I want to focus on today to think about these kinds of questions. Now, I have a much longer version of this paper where I go into a great deal of kind of what you might call a history of ideas approach to thinking about the concept of the Earth. And I do this through the English language, which is interesting, it seems to me, because there are three roots into the English language of Earth-type words. It seems to me that you probably have two of those in Dutch or Germanic languages. But let me say something very briefly about that. There is the Anglo-Saxon Germanic Earth from the German Erde, and there's a, a whole range of cognate terms in other Germanic languages around this. But English also has the Latin, Norman, French heritage of words like terra, terrain, terrestrial, and so on. But the most interesting, it seems to me, are the Greek-rooted words around this notion of the geo, geography, geology, geometry, geopolitics, all going back to the Greek sense of what the earth is or what that rootedness in a place, in the soil is. But it seems to me that even in geography, geology, geometry, and geopolitics, we're getting increasingly detached from that earthy material sense of the politics that these things are going on with. So geopolitics, as I suggested, increasingly becoming global politics or big international relations. Geometry becoming more and more abstract as a branch of mathematics. Geography no longer the etymological sense as earth writing, but geography being a discipline that is somewhat of a catch-all for a whole range of other work that could easily, I think, be done in cultural studies and sociology and international relations and so on. And it's perhaps only in geology, so in the physical sciences, that that root sense of the word of what the geo is perhaps endured. But even there, uh, certainly in the UK, earth science is increasingly supplanting that as the academic discipline within those areas. But it's that sense of the geo that I want to retrieve in both geopolitics, but also in geometrics, uh, as a sense of earth measuring, earth power, thinking about the earth in relation to politics. You find this recognition of a detachment of the discipline of studying and the object that's being studied even as early as Aristotle. In the metaphysics, he says, geometry differs from measurement of the earth only in that the latter deals with what we perceive, whereas the former deals with the unperceived. One is becoming increasingly detached from the other. Now, he's using this to reflect on practices rather than just analysis of the practices, but there's a distinction that's being made that I think is important and comes to its fruition in the scientific revolution with the increasingly detached, abstract, mathematical science of geometry that you find in Descartes and the people that come after him. Now, those different etymologies, the different roots into the English language and other languages have political resonances often. It's often said in English, <coughs> that if you use Anglo-Saxon Germanic rooted words, that you're being more Anglo-Saxon or you're being more earthy in terms of the vocabulary that you're using to describe those questions, used in a somewhat derogatory sense to mean a kind of rudimentary or crude. Anglo-Saxon can be a kind of vernacular word for swearing in English. But you find that earthy as meaning worldly concerns, as meaning the profane as opposed to the spiritual in other ways as well. If you look at St. Augustine, for example, he distinguishes between the city of God 
and the earthly city. And he notes how in Genesis, God fashioned man out of the dust of the earth. There's something rooted and grounded and material in human life as opposed to the spiritual world of religion. And of course, the heaven and earth contrast is found throughout the Old and New Testament. And then in the Middle Ages, gets recoded in a political way as the distinction between eternal spiritual power that the Pope would have and the secular, temporal, earthy power that uh, the rulers such as princes, kings, and emperors would have. And with this sense of earth and how we might trace earth and related words in their political sense, you could do something similar with the notion of soil uh, and the German politics of Blut und Boden, blood and soil as it was used by the Nazis, or you could do something similar with the concept of land, homeland, fatherland, motherland, the promised land, the holy land, Eretz Israel, land of our fathers, and so on. And I think you can see from those, if you start to relate earth to soil or earth to land, how a reactionary politics is not very far away from an appeal to this as the thing that we might want to ground or found politics upon. You can find this in a whole range of examples. The Greek myths of autochthony, for example, the idea that the uh, ancestors of Thebes or of Athens were born from the very soil of the place that they now inhabit. This is an attempt to tie politics to a particular location, to a particular heritage in terms of the people uh, that, that were the ancestors that you're now following in their footsteps, of why you should be in this place rather than that place, and about laying claim to a particular portion of the Earth's surface and the politics around there. They also are used often to disavow the importance of women in uh, the politics. If somebody can be born from the very soil, as in um, the story of sowing the dragon's teeth into the ground and the warriors that burst forth from the soil, then women don't become so important to the construction of a polis because the mother is actually the earth of the particular place. So this geopolitics then might be, as a politics of the earth, very close to a reactionary political agenda. As I mentioned, Friedrich Ratzel's notion of Lebensraum, Metzen Heidegger's distinction between earth and world, and his reimagining of autochthony as something that goes on not just in practice, but also in thought. Karl Schmidt's Nomos of the Earth, the Erde in Schmidt. All of these ideas partnered by deeply reactionary right-wing racist politics. So Karl Schmidt, for example, drawing on the ancient Greek meaning, suggesting that nomos means both a law and a division. Nomos, he says, is the measure by which the ground and soil of the earth in a particular order is divided and situated. It's also the form of political, social, and religious order determined by the process. Here, measure, order, and form constitute a spatially concrete unity. Schmidt makes the claim, and this is picked up by others after him, uh, Peter Schlatterdijk being the most recent, that it's only with the explorations of the late 15th century that the earth as a globe became tangible, became something that people had some kind of way of relating to. I mean, even the ancient Greeks knew that the earth was a sphere, but it wasn't until the circumnavigation of the globe through Magellan that, uh, in the early 16th century that that sense became part of the way that people conceived about these things in terms of the potential expansion of politics across the whole globe. Schmidt argues that the new global image or the global world picture, something that Heidegger also talks about, requires a new global spatial order, a new sense of politics, a new nomos of the earth to make sense of these questions. Heidegger also tries to develop things along similar lines. Heidegger believes that the Roman Latin translation of Greek thought, the way that Greek terms are taken into the Latin language and then into the Romance languages from there, has led to an increased detachment of the words that are used to signify the concepts that they relate to. He calls this bodenlosikite, literally the loss of the soil, the uprooting or the unrooting of concepts from the grounds that gave them birth. And he's trying to retrieve a sense of what he might call a bodenstandlikite, a rootedness in the soil for the thought that he's trying to proclaim. And he does this in a range of ways. He does this in his reading of the poet Friedrich Herdlin, he also does this in terms of his reading of the famous painting uh, by Van Gogh, uh, which Heidegger takes to be a pair of peasant shoes. There's actually a big debate about whether these are really the shoes of a peasant woman, as Heidegger takes them to be, or whether they were Van Gogh's own boots that he'd just taken off as he walked in the, the city. But Heidegger wants to tie this to a particular location 
the world as he understands it, the relation to the earth of the peasant woman. And he goes into long detail trying to imagine a kind of a, a backstory to the painting of the shoes, of what sorts of things you can see there in terms of a rootedness in the soil, an attachment to a particular kind of place. Earth also appears in Heidegger's later work, uh, where he's talking again about Herdlin. Herdlin is a, a recurrent reference for Heidegger's thoughts as he tries to work through these kinds of questions. And here he's talking about, could we find another way of gaining a measure for the Earth? Instead of the derivative calculative politics that he thinks is so problematic in so many ways that we have from modernity, is there another way through poetry, through art, that we can retrieve a sense of a relation to the earth. And so this is where Heidegger's idea of, through poetry, a new measure of the earth, a different way of thinking about these kinds of relations come to. And that question of the relation of measure or calculation is important to Heidegger at a range of times in his career. And it seemed to me until very recently that this was the way that Heidegger tried to make sense of Nazi politics and his own involvement with the Nazi party. We know now from the unpublished notebooks that are slowly being published in German that Heidegger also turns that critique of calculation uh, for a very racial purpose because he saw calculation as being one of the ways to understand uh, the Jewish mindset. And that Heidegger's anti-Semitism comes through in the notebooks very explicitly tied to this critique of calculation, which complicates some of the ways that people like me had thought about these questions before. But Heidegger's trying in the 1930s, at a moment when he's both in, in the Nazi party but increasingly at odds with some of the things the regime is doing, to work through some of these questions, to try to think about the politics of calculation. And for Heidegger, it keeps going back to this question of the earth and the relation to the question of the earth. Now today, if we think about people, political groups that lay claim to particular parts of the earth's surface, and the relation that they have to those areas, while well, you can find a whole range of movements that are making those kinds of claims. Calls for a religious, national, cultural rights to promised lands coming through, in, obviously, in Israel's claim to the West Bank, but in Argentina's claim to Las Malvinas, perhaps Spain's claim to Gibraltar, another contested the world over from Western Sahara to Kashmir, and in self-determination movements as well. So Earth, as a ground for politics, seems destined to replicate all of these politically regressive ways of thinking of colonial, settler, aggressive, and expansionist geopolitics. But might there be a way of rethinking this that doesn't buy into all of that problematic politics of those thinkers? Are there resources in other thinkers, and I'll talk a little bit about Deleuze and Guattari's work on geophilosophy, or Elizabeth Gross's work on geopower, are there resources here to think about geopolitics as earth politics differently? And even in Heidegger, might there be resources for making sense of earth measuring, the literal sense of geometry, geometrics, the measuring of the earth? Now, I tried to think this through, as I said, and it's become somewhat more problematic by the uh, previously unpublished notebooks, tried to think this through in the book Speaking Against Number. Speaking Against Number was a book about Heidegger, and the speaking against number in the title was meant in two ways, at least. One is a phrase, speaking against number, language versus calculation, you might say. The other, though, was that the three parts of the book are different ways of conceptualizing the political through Heidegger. The first one speaking is through rhetorical politics, the importance of a language community of uh, shared hearing and listening. For Heidegger, the key political text of this period is actually not Aristotle's politics or Aristotle's ethics, but Aristotle's rhetoric, because of the way the rhetoric helps us to make sense of a language community. This, in a sense, is when Heidegger's nationalism is linguistic rather than racial. It's the German language and the German-speaking peoples that are important. The second kind of cut through Heidegger and politics was Heidegger thinking the notion of polemics, thinking the notion of what he calls an outside and a, a breaking apart from another or a setting apart from another. Politics as being polemos, struggle, combat, as the uh, polemical way that you might think about these questions. And the third one was the critique 
through this notion of calculation, about how number as a particular way of rendering and making sense of the world could be problematic and could lead to a particular set of political questions. So it was an attempt to turn Heidegger's thought to purposes other than those that he put it to himself, as a way of thinking, how could this work be used for progressive political purposes as a critique of Nazism, as a critique of the way that they thought about these kinds of questions. You can also find resources in this, I think, in some of the work of Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, uh, particularly in um, the Thousand Plateaus book and in then the last book, which most people seem to accept was written by Deleuze alone, although Guattari's name was added to it, What is Philosophy?, which makes a lot of the question of geophilosophy. How might we use the work in there of the importance of the geo, the importance of what they call the processes of deterritorialization and reterritorialization, the making and remaking of spatial relations? How could we think about these uh, in different ways that might open up some potential for these questions? And the most useful way that I think that work has been developed is by the Australian feminist writer Elizabeth Gross talking in a book called Chaos Territory Art, Deleuze and the Framing of the Earth, thinking about the relation between earth and territory. Territory for her has something added to the earth. It's not simply the earth uh, shaped in an un unproblematic way, but it is framed, it has qualities, it is ordered, it is constructed. So she says the quote here, the frame is what establishes territory out of the chaos that is the earth. The frame is thus the first construction, the corners of the plane of composition. With no frame or boundary, there can be no territory. Without territory, there may be objects or things, but not qualities that can become expressive, that can intensify and transform living bodies. Territory here may be understood as surfaces of variable curvature or inflection that bear upon them singularities, eruptions, or events. Territory is that which is produced by the elaborate apparently useless activity of construction, attention grabbing and display that mark most sexual selection. So for Elizabeth Gross, there is a kind of vitalist element here, a vibrancy to these questions. It's the relation of territory and body going together, both are framed, both are ordered out of the chaos of the earth as it exists. Territory and body, she says, only emerge as such to the extent that such qualities can be extracted. There is a process, a transformation, a working, a reworking of these relations. Now, I have some suspicions about this way of thinking. I'm skeptical about vitalism. I'm skeptical about the uh, agency that's being uh, imputed to these questions. I think it risks collapsing territory into territoriality, which for me are distinct terms that need to be kept apart. But I like in this the idea that there is a process, a making and a remaking. <coughs> the territory is not simply a static object, a container within which things happen, but a, a what you might call a tangled multiplicity of relations, of political, economic, strategic, legal, uh, technical, and here we might add, on Gross's terms, a kind of sensual way of thinking about it. It's not at all clear, it seems to me, that Deleuze and Guattari mean by territory what political geographers or international relations do by territory. And I don't think anyone's really worked through the distinction between how they're using the term and how political geography and international relations uses the term. But there's something in this, particularly in the way of the earth as this kind of chaotic thing that is shaped through political processes that I find uh, productive. So Gross continues a couple of later uh, passages from the book. There is only earth rather than territory until qualities are let loose in the world. Qualities and territory coexist, and both are the condition for sexual selection and for art making, or perhaps to the art of sexual selection and equally the sexuality of art production. And so she then goes on, the earth can be infinitely divided, territorialized. Territorialized is the process of making and remaking and of frame. But unless it is in some way demarcated, nature itself is incapable of sexualizing life making life alluring, and so on. So it's about how the framing is how chaos becomes territory. Thinking about this as the set of processes, set of human and more than human processes, that make, shape, and remake these kinds of questions. 
Now, geographers have taken a while to pick up on some of these ideas that Gross is exploring in these questions. But I think there's some potential in her work for this rethinking of the notion of the geo within geopolitics, and by extension, the notion of geometrics, of Earth measuring. But Gross introduces a third term that I think is productive for these kinds of questions and relations. This comes in a, a discussion she had with geographers two years ago at the Association of American Geographers annual meeting. She says, the relation between the Earth and its various forces and living beings and their not always distinguishable forces are forms of geopower. If power is conceived as the engagement of clashing, competing forces, power, the relations between humans or perhaps even between living things, is a certain historically locatable capitalization on the forces of geopower. Geopower are these processes of which only some of them are human relations with other things in the world. There's something bigger than this, uh, the clash of competing forces at this level of the earth that are going on, that are shaped and reshaped by particular ways that humans engage with these questions. Now this, it seems to me, opens up a way of thinking about power in relation to the earth, or what we might call the politics of the earth, that takes into account, and much more seriously than before, the power of natural processes or resources, the dynamics of human environment relations, the interrelation of objects outside of human intervention, the relation between the biosphere, the atmosphere, and the lithosphere, the complex interrelation that produce, continually transform, and rework the question of territory and state spatial strategies. Manuel de Landa has made some important strides towards thinking these questions through, particularly in his book, A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History. Literary theorist Jonathan Bate looks at the way that poetry can retrieve a connection to the earth. The philosopher John Protevi has suggested what he calls the hybrid multiplicity of geo, hydro, solar, bio, techno politics to make sense of all of these complicated relations that are going on here. And Jane Bennett, political theorist, uh, similarly wants to retrieve an active, earthy sense to what she calls vibrant matter. Now, in Foucault's work, the notion of biopower and biopolitics have often been mentioned, and the relation between the two has sometimes not been clarified. People often suggest the two are effectively synonyms. But it's been suggested that biopolitics is a particular and narrower set of questions between, within the wider frame of biopower. I've made a similar suggestion to what's going on here. Geopower is the broader category within which geopolitics operates. So within this wider thinking of geopower following Elizabeth Gross's work, perhaps we can resituate what we mean by geopolitics as a politics of the earth, and that that geopolitics would sit alongside rather than replace the attention that's been given to biopolitics in recent years. It seems to me it's not that one has been replaced by the other or that one is more important than the other, but geopolitics and biopolitics coexist and it's the complicated interrelations between them that should be the focus of what we think about these questions. Foucault's work on biopower, of course, has been developed in a whole range of interesting and productive ways. In his lecture courses, from society must be defended to the recent government of the living, you can trace what Foucault himself does with these categories in his work. But it's this relation between biopower, biometrics, and biopolitics that I think some of the most interesting work picking up on those ideas is being done today. Biopower and biopolitics developed by people like Giorgio Gambon, Roberto Esposito, um, Hart and Negri, Dylan and Reed. Biometrics being picked up by people like Louisa Moore and Joseph Pugliese. But just as with biopower, biometrics, biopolitics, it's the threefold relation between geopower, geometrics, and geopolitics that I think we need to think about. Geometrics then should be understood not as this abstract branch of mathematics, but as earth measuring, the literal, originary sense of the term. Even as far back as Herodotus, the Greek historian, there's a story of who the original earth measurers are. They were surveyors in ancient Egypt, sent out each year after the Nile floods had subsided to mark out, to measure the land in the farmer's fields. The markers had been washed away by the flood water, they needed to go out and survey the land to mark this out again. 
The claim has been made that then the ancient Greeks picked up on this very practical sense of Earth measuring, and it was the ancient Greeks, Thales through to Euclid, that pick up on this and turn this more into the branch of mathematics. Uh, but even um, that was always something that was used for practical purposes. There's a whole range of ways it gets used uh, through the uh, antiquity, through the Middle Ages, um, before it becomes the fully abstract calculative geometry that we know today. I tried to make sense of this in relation to the question of territory in the book The Birth of Territory, where I try to understand territory as what I call a political technology along the lines that Foucault thinks about population. It's not simply land or terrain as containers, as, as things that are out there, but it's about the techniques that are used for measuring the land, for controlling the terrain, thinking about the technical and the legal alongside uh, the kind of economic and the strategic ways of thinking about those questions. I toyed for a long time with the title of this book. One of them that I had was the geometry of the political, the earth measuring of the political. How does politics and the surface of the earth demarcation relate with each other? I changed the title in the end, but that was still an important part of the argument that I was trying to make there. And I discussed some very practical earth measuring techniques that are used that seem to me important for that wider story of the question of territory. So these are some of the images from the work known as the Corpus Sacramentorum Romanorum, the body of writings of the Roman land surveyors or land measurers. Uh, Frontinus was one of the most famous of these, but it was a practical handbook that was used for the surveying largely of farmland, uh, but particularly lands that were conquered through the Roman Empire's expansion and then given to the uh, soldiers that had made that expansion possible. But how did you divide up these portions of land along particular kinds of lines? I also got very interested in some 14th century Italian jurists who make an argument about the relation between jurisdiction and territory. But one of the texts that one of these, Bartolos of Sasso Ferrato, writes is also a text that is very practical earth measuring. These are, it's probably difficult to see with the distance you are, but these are what happens if a river changes course and washes the land on one bank of the river <coughs> onto the other bank of the river. Which farmer owns that land if the river was the dividing line between their properties? Or if an island emerges in the middle of a river, who can lay claim to that piece of land? Or if a river dries up through a drought, who owns the rights to the dried up riverbed? Now, Bartolus takes these arguments, which are, these are classical questions about property law that you can find back as far as the Byzantine Emperor Justinian in the Institutes. But Bartolus says, we can use geometry as much as we can use legal arguments to understand and to resolve these kinds of questions. So in his text, uh, the Tractatus on, on Rivers, there is a set of what we might call a kind of a legal geometry to make sense of these questions, as well as simply a textual uh, legal argument. So is there potential in some of these for thinking about earth measuring geometry in those senses rather than the abstract way of thinking about these kinds of questions. But there's other ways that earth measuring might be understood rather than simply the parcelization of portions of the earth's surface. Land surveying, of course, but also work that looks at measuring yields of oil and gas, soil fertility, air quality. These two would be senses of earth measuring in this sense. Now, I'm not alone in making these kinds of suggestions. It seems to me there's a lot of people that think about these ideas develop ideas and do productive things with those kinds of questions. So Phil Steinberg, a uh, political geographer and international relations theorist, talking about the social construction of the ocean. And Phil has a, an emergent interest in the question of ice. Ice as a dynamic property and a blurred status between sea, water in its liquid state, and solid land. The suggestion being, just as we have a UN convention on the law of the sea, and long-standing laws that apply to territory on land, do we also need a law of ice? Ice is a dynamic, physical question that has important political implications. Similarly, work on river boundaries complicates any sense that political boundaries of territory are static and are fixed. Rivers, of course, change course. If you have a boundary that runs down the middle of a river, the river is likely to change course over time, and so the political boundary and the geophysical boundary diversify. Unless, of course, you do works of hydropolitics where you try and channel and control rivers. Of course, in 
um, the Netherlands, this is an obvious example where you can see how water is trained and channeled. You also find this in terms of political boundaries, such as the Rio Grande between the US and Mexico, which now runs through a largely concrete channel for large parts to tame the river, to make this geophysical feature match the political reality rather than the other way around. Somebody like Chilla Krupa in uh, the book Hotspotters Report, looking at the legacies of military landscapes uh, in terms of the way that they uh, inherited areas that were used for uh, testing of bombs, areas that you, the relation that these have to landscapes and bodies. Rachel Woodward writing a book on military geographies, not the geographies used by the military, but the impact the military has had on geography in terms of uh, areas where weapons are tested, in terms of training areas, uh, and so on. Other work, there's plenty of work on oil and an emergent literature on oil that looks at oil and its geophysical properties. So Matthew Huber's Lifeblood being an example. You can also look at Timothy Mitchell's Carbon Democracy. Thinking about this object and the implications that politics has. Andrew Barry's more recent book, uh, Material Politics, on the politics of a pipeline. Thinking about the pipeline and the implications this has uh, for politics around these questions. People who've worked on the question of terrain. Derek Gregory recently has been working on what he calls the natures of war. The question of terrain in the sense of a jungle, a desert, an arctic tundra region. All of these have important implications for how the military fights a campaign, how it fights a war. The materiality of the politics, the earth politics within that question. Or you can look at work on political ecology. Uh, so the example here is the Geopolitics and the Green Revolution book by John Perkins, um, some years old. But what it's looking at is the way that uh, questions around agriculture became politicized within the Cold War. And even today, uh, with North Korea, there's an attempt to use satellites to measure how well the harvest is going in order that you can see whether there's likely to be a famine um, emerging within that country and then the geopolitical implications that this would have. Or there's the work of people like Saskia Assassin on land grabs, on the way that large areas of land within uh, countries within in the continent of Africa or in South America are being taken by other states, China and other powers, to use for agriculture, for biofuels, for mineral rights and so on. The states are doing what Saskia Sassen calls the unbundling of rights over the territory, the abrogation of those rights to other places. Now, just as Foucault, I think, is misplaced in saying there was a shift in politics from territory to population, it seems to me that any contemporary concentration on biopolitics alone at the expense of geopolitics is similarly misjudged. And there's the relation between biopolitics and geopolitics that I think is important, of places embodied and the embodiment of places, of the individuals and the life and the governance of those individuals and the governance of the places, the location, the earth in which and on which they live. The way that we think about those relations, though, is clearly changing. And that's where I think some of this productive work, these examples and others, are starting to develop things along these kinds of lines. It seems to me that just in the way that I tried to read Foucault almost against himself, the strategies that will turn towards the object and constitution of population are similarly directed towards the object and constitution of territory. Territory understood as a process, not an outcome, the political technology rather than the container of political action. But the very same techniques that were directed towards population are also those that are central to the idea of territory these calculative techniques, these modes of measuring and controlling that find their expression in things such as land surveying, terrain analysis, cartographic practices, administrative strategies, statistical surveys, legal codes, financial techniques, and military technologies. And these calculative technologies in both biopolitical and geopolitical registers as biometrics and geometrics measuring land and the earth and thinking about that relation today. Just as those calculative techniques are crucial to modern statecraft, so too are those techniques, regimes of global calculation, crucial today to Earth, to geopolitics. I want to give a more practical example uh, at this point as I bring things towards a close. Simon Dolby, a uh, political geographer who has written a range of questions around environment and geopolitics, 
has recently been talking about what he calls the geopolitics of climate change. And what he does in that essay is very generously engage with a piece of my writing, an essay called Secure the Volume, and tries to develop things from that and push them to think about the question of climate change. So I want to say something about his work and then conclude with a few thoughts on the notion of the Anthropocene. What I try and do in that Secure the Volume paper is to say, too often when we think about territory or other political spaces, we tend to think of them as very flat. We tend to think of them in a way that a map represents a political space. But territory is a physical, material object. It's something that exists, of course, in three dimensions. It has height and depth rather than simple extent on a flat, planar surface. How do we think about territory as a volume rather than an area? And what I try and do in that is to say it's not simply up and down, a straightforward up and down axis of height and depth, but it's about angles, slopes, and the materiality. So I talk about aerial surveillance, aerial bombing, but I also talk about tunnels, what goes on below the surface. And there's a range of examples that I give there, many of them um, coming out of the West Bank, coming out of the way that Israel and the architecture of occupation in A.R. Weissman's terms, thinking about subsoil, tunnels, infrastructure, foundation, these kinds of questions, and linking them to the work on aerial surveillance, drone warfare, visual surveillance, and so on. So it seems to me important that if we are to have a renewed politics of the earth, this geopolitics, that it would be attuned to the complexities of space and territory in all dimensions, rather than the flat surface area sense of it. So how then, if we were to think about geopolitics, geometrics, geopower, if we take the air, subsoil, <clears throat> lands, terrain, territory, earth processes, and understandings of the world, rather than simply the global for this? And how does this relate to geopolitics? Well, it seems to me that some of the work that is being done is expanding and developing through some of those ideas around there. Gaston Gordillo thinking about the question of terrain as a material physical force that's important in politics. And then, as I said, Simon Dolby thinking about these questions uh, in relation to climate change. If you look at a map, for example, of the Arctic, this is a map that my colleagues, ex-colleagues at Durham did of the competing territorial claims that are being made of the Arctic, the North Pole and the Arctic Ocean. And in that, there's a whole range of different questions that are going on. Climate change is making this a more pressing concern because so much that was always solid ice is now becoming fluid, sometimes ice, sometimes open water. The territorial claims which are going on both on the surface, in the volume of the water, so fishing rights, but also in the, sub, um, the, the underwater, the claims that are being made to the seabed, these are also important in thinking about these questions. So here the territorial geopolitical claims, economic, strategic, legal, and technical, certainly, but the materiality of these and the fluid, dynamic nature of the materiality important around these kinds of questions. I'll move over those quotes. But what Dolby is doing with the argument that I tried to make is to say, if we're looking at some of the ways that climate change is a political question for us today, some of these volume geometrics are important in thinking about these kinds of questions. Thinking about the way that earth measuring and different measures that are used in the contested political processes in the production and interpretation of those measures, how these are being used to understand the dynamics of climate and the importance of human impact on the earth, this is the notion being called the Anthropocene. This is the thing that Dolby thinks is important here about how geopolitics of the climate change needs to take into account the geo processes rather than simply the big international politics of these kind of questions. How does the materiality impact in the way we might think about those? And it's the last few comments I want to make are about this notion of the Anthropocene. I think if we think of a range of questions risk, security, prediction, aid, sustainability, development, finance, the economy, population. Many of these fit within the realm of what Foucault calls biopolitics. The politics of calculation in relation to the politics of life. 
What I want to suggest is that alongside, and as ways of thinking all of those and more, we also need to think about earth, land, world, the global. These are not simply frames within which biopolitics takes place. They're also active, shaped, and shaping. These spaces then, between which, over which, such regimes operate, shape, and calculate, is a crucial element that is important to think about in these terms. We need to think about geopolitics then as more than global politics or international politics. It's a material, earthy sense that I want to retrieve in this. And it's not by earth a simple sense of earth as solid land, but it's the geophysical in all of its varieties, water, ice, the subsoil, and the submarine, putting the geophysical back into the geopolitical. Thinking then biopolitics but alongside that geopolitics. Thinking about that along the terms that Elizabeth Gross suggests of geopower, as she says, uh, the engagement of clashing competing forces, some of which are human, more of which are living, many of which are what Jane Bennett calls vibrant matter, or some of which might be called animate objects as opposed to inanimate objects. And the, the best example I can think of this is a wonderful novel by Ben Marcus called The Age of Wire and String, where objects, everyday objects, have an agency, a vibrancy to them. I think it gets at a lot of what Jane Bennett's trying to think about with these questions. So that Elizabeth Gross suggestion I gave you a little earlier, the relation between the Earth and the various forces, living beings, and they're not always distinguishable forces, are forms of geopower. Geopower is this wide frame within which human-only power is but a subset, but a small example of those questions. William Connolly has similarly been developing things along these lines. Thinking about, he says, one theme of this book, The Fragility of Things, his latest book, is that the planet, and indeed the cosmos, is replete with self-organizing spatio-temporal systems flowing at different speeds, levels of sophistication, and degrees of self-sustaining power. These impersonal systems are open to some degree and never in perfect equilibrium. They interact with each having a degree of entanglement with several others. And alongside this crucial, for me, element on types of calculation of the way things are reduced to numbers, to modes of measure, these can be understood, one set obviously is biometrics, but about these techniques of calculation, operations of measure and control that are directed towards the earth, the geo, so that, in this broader sense, as I'm trying to suggest, of geometrics that would include, but not be reducible to the abstract applied arts of geometry, but would help us to make sense of regimes of calculation and their relation to global governance, to global politics more generally. And that politics of the earth would, I think, ultimately be appropriate to the Anthropocene, especially what Simon Dolby has called Anthropocene geopolitics. In that, at least, I would hope there would be a serious critical focus on the notion of the geo. The Anthropocene, of course, is supposed to be an understanding of a period in the Earth's chronology, and that that Earth comes through even more strongly than it does even within critical geopolitics. That's then what I mean by this regrounding of geopolitics, a renewed emphasis on the ground, the Earth, the geo element of those political questions. William Connolly has talked about the need for thinking through this relation between political economy and environmental issues, especially in the light of the work he's been doing for several years on what he calls the philosophy of becoming. So his suggestion to come to terms with the looping relations between capitalist production, carbon and methane emissions, state policy, consumption practices, glacier movements, and climate change sets the stage to link political economy regularly to the behavior of non-human force fields. If political geography, geopolitics, which for me is as important to political science and international relations as it is to the discipline of geography, if political geography, geopolitics, is to live up to the promise of its name, then it's crucial that it needs to be at the very forefront of these kinds of debates. <coughs>